Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you to the university, Madam Vice Minister. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to see the paradox concept to be featured today. Uh, it's one of my early writings. Uh, I'm not saying I'm the only one who called mediation a paradox, but it's certainly one of those who did that. Um, I have many hats, as you can see. Uh, I've been teaching since 1995. I'm now a mediator at JAMS, uh, but today I'm using the insignia of the foundation because it's relatively new, so I'm happy for you to see it. We are a bunch of former um, international organization officials, mediators, academics, judges, and our goal at the foundation, which is a not-for-profit, is a charity entity, is to help people and organizations interact better together. As Elena Kolsaki said, Saying this at this time is challenging. I was recently in a country where the very word of mediation triggered concerns about that being illegal. The notion would be the weaker party would be at a disadvantage. The starting point is the famous European Union Directive. And like every piece of legislation, um, as you can see on mediation, it would talk about confidentiality. Who would not want to be mediation to be confidential? Quality, who would not do that? The key part of that piece of legislation, you all know, so we're not going to spend time on this, is this idea in Article 1 that there would have to be a balanced relationship between litigation and mediation. What does that mean? Well, nobody knows, but one thing is for sure, these data are somewhat old, but I think they're still true today, that if by balanced relationship we think about numbers, what percentage of the litigated cases are mediated, the balance is not there. Try to Google mediator in Lithuania and see how many entries you get. Try to Google attorney in Lithuania and every country, and you see the differences. How many people do you know, globally, who make a living 100% out of mediation? Not people who teach and do other things, not pracademics. The pra practice-oriented academics are called pracademics, right? How many people do you know who make a full-time living out of litigation? This is no way to discourage you, but to focus on the importance of what we're talking about for policymakers the legal framework, your responsibility, and ours as well. The bad thing about not having enough mediation is that billions are wasted every year. A study of the European Parliament a few years back estimated in 50 billions per year the losses by not having mediation if mediation only resolved 50% of all the cases. You go to mediation, the case might fail. And if the case fails, what happens? You've gone to mediation, spend time and money, and then you go to litigation. So you have two processes, right? So there are pluses and minuses. Well, at that time, the numbers we're talking about was not random. It was based on a formula that looked at the average cost of litigation compared to the average cost of mediation. And then with a simple Excel file sheet, you could see what would be the savings if mediation succeeded 70% of the time, 50, 30, 40, or 20. In fact, we were able, the parliament was able, parliament study, and I don't want to say it was the parliament, myself and other researchers came up with the idea of the break-even point. That is, what is the minimum percentage of mediations in a year, in a country, that need to be successful so that the costs of failed mediations is offset by the advantages of successful mediation. What is the advantage of successful mediation? If mediation is successful, you spend less time, there is no trial, and there are no trial costs, right? One process, mediation, as opposed to trial. And as you can see, with only 24% uh, success, there would be, for the society, for the pub, there would be a savings uh, uh, just with one mediation succeeding out of four. So here's the paradox. We have a super performing process mediation, yet that is hardly used. 
In one of my other writings, I speak about sleeping beauty, mediation being in sleeping beauty. It's there, it's beautiful, and yet it's asleep. Some say it's in a coma, if we look at the numbers, right? Um, it turns out that the paradox of, for us, the human race, is not only relating to mediation. Um, this is a, an old study which had very important political consequences. So these numbers are relatively old because, thank God, things changed. But a number of years back, two researchers, Goldstein and Johnston, tried to figure out how come there are countries which are linguistically, culturally, and geographically close, Germany and Austria, where the majority of the people you see in blue would be willing to donate their organs if they die. And you can see in Germany at the time was only 12%. And you see the difference. There is no middle ground. Is either everybody, or close to everybody, upper 90s, or nobody. What do you think was the difference between Germany and Austria? The culture, the education, the response is in the name of study. Save the default, save lives. It wasn't in the form that people were asked to sign at the DMV, um, this American, uh, the part of the motor vehicles, where you get your license to drive. Where people were asked, are you willing to donate your organs if you die? Sign here. People would not bother lifting the pen and signing. Who wants to think about death? To the contrary, and there was Austria, as well, Austria, yes. The form would say, have you anything against us donating the organs if you die? If you have something, sign up here. People, again, would not bother pick up the pen and sign it. The consequences was that people were expressing consent to that. Nobel Prize winners have taught us, Kahneman and then Richard Thaler, that we are not rational in making decisions under uncertainty. And what uncertainty can you think might be bigger than accepting a settlement in the face of an expectation of a winning result in court? We are not rational by all means. And that means that the way to put people to do the right thing as a policymaker is nudging, which is much more efficient than obliging people. Nudging meaning, means creating the condition for people to do the right or the better thing, winning inertia. What does this mean? Well, do you, do you need to wear a helmet uh, in Lithuania to drive a scooter? Assuming somebody is so crazy to do it with this cold. Uh, uh, do you need to wear a seatbelt when you drive? Right? Okay. Doesn't it make sense? Why do, why do we need a law to do that? It's safer for us, it's safer for our community, right? It's safer for the people we love. And yet, what would honestly happen, not to you, you are decent people, uh, you are magic people because you are mediation people, right? <laughs> you are the good people. What do you think would happen to the majority of the people in your country if all of a sudden this requirement was no longer there? Well, psychologists, again, will tell us what happened. People will stop doing that because this behavior requires effort, right? People would let it go. And poet Ovidius told us more than 2,000 years ago, video bona proboque deteriora autem sequor. We don't do the right thing, generally speaking, as the Nobel Prize winners told us. Now, nudging, is that legal? Well, according to the Court of Justice of the European Union, it is. This is a leading case of 2010. Uh, the Alassini judgment, it was an Italian case, confirmed by another case in 2017, the Menini judgment, right? And as you can see, the court was very explicit about mandatory mediation, or at least non-voluntary mediation, which is, first of all, any system that is not requiring this behavior is not efficient. It's not me, it's the court, okay? And the seconds are the parameters. Under what conditions can a law impose such restrictions to immediate, unfettered, unlimited access to court? Four pieces. Has to be non-binding. Mediation is not. 
You might be forced into the mediator's room, but you don't have to sign an agreement. So mediation fits, check, the number one. Does not cause a substantial delay, then you can do it easily by law. Mediation will last no more than X days. And that particular case was 60 days, right? And the court ruled that 60 days was acceptable. So two, suspends a period of time um, uh, barring the statute of limitations. Most statutes would say that if you file for mediation, you will not miss a court deadline. The fourth is the tricky one. It is, it has to be free or very low cost. But provided these four features are there, mediation is not only okay, but it's the only way to make the process mandatory mediation efficient. So here's my title. The model that comes out from behavioral economics, psychology, and the law, they all converge into a possible model whereby we need to mediate mediation itself. Who are the litigants in this case? One, the fundamental universal principle that nobody can be forced to settle, and the universal data, experiential numbers, that voluntary mediation is not thriving in any place in the world. So the solution is to make mandatory to require participation, not in an information meeting. Information should be provided by lawyers in their office. But just to meet with your own mediator with the other side and see if you want to go further. If you don't want to go further, voluntariness kick in, you withdraw, you're going to face no sanctions because you have shown up but you have to show up, at least for the first meeting. Imagine going to a restaurant, and instead of being obliged to buy your uh, dish of lasagna, you're only obliged to buy and pay for a little tiny bit. If you like it, you will buy the rest of the lasagna. That is, you will engage in the full mediation process. If not, you have exhausted your duty as a citizen, to try, okay? That's the model, that's the idea. Here's an example of how this works, for example, for, in my country, and you see, you have to uh, show up, right? But of course, if you don't like where that's going, you can withdraw. But if you don't show up, there will be consequences. Um, the numbers are correct, <laughs> they came through last night but the images are not. But as you can see, after 13 years of the system, still 71% of the disputes being mediated are cases where the law tells you you have to. So what about the culture of mediation among Italian lawyers and clients? They just do it when they have to, right? So it's not a matter of culture. <laughs> it's a matter of law. The law might change the culture. The culture will not change the law. Right? Or at least it's going to take ages, generations. These are the numbers. And we hear, we'll be hearing about uh, Greece, Turkey is another example where the mediation market went from zero to millions. And the, future, the key feature is one, which is some degree of requirement is needed. It's very interesting to note that as countries try to put some obligations on the plaintiff, you have to try this and to provide sanctions for those who don't, international organizations such as the World Bank put that obligation on the defendant. The World Bank is an employer of who? Of the employees of the World Bank. And these are the rules that apply if you work for the, for the World Bank. If somebody asks for mediation, you have to appear. It's a similar opt-out model. I like to call it easy opt-out because, of course, you can always walk out of a mediation, right? The question is, if you paid a lot of money in advance, <laughs> to opt out, that is, to leave a mediation, might be not that easy. If you've paid only the little bite of lasagna, remember, it might be easy for you to say, thank you, I tried, right? You don't have, do not have to bear excessive cost. When I was the chief of the mediation uh, service, Ombudsman Mediation Service for the United Nations Funds and Programs, in 2001, the five agencies called the Funds and Programs signed at my request, this mediation pledge, which is similarly worded, as you can see, to the one at the United Nations. 
if an employee asks the employer the, to try mediation, the employer, in suitable cases, will sit down. This is a very powerful tool for organizations, huh? because nobody wants to ask for mediation in order to not to appear weak. But the defendant doesn't want to sit down either. They don't want to create a precedent. They don't want to appear weak. They don't want to make the suggestion that as long as you ask, something will be given to you. When there is a policy like this, it's easier for the plaintiff to say, I have to do it, but it's also easy for the defendant. I have to do it. We don't care about their motivations, the important things, and the parties show, show up, and the magic happens. And the magic happens. Okay? The famous International Institute for Conflict Prevention Resolution out of New York, CPR, at the time referred to this model of the mediation pledge as, as a model for the world. To sum up, and I'm sorry to those of you who have seen this already, to enter into the, this idea, we have to obliterate an old say, which is you can lead the horse to water, but you cannot force the horse to drink. I think there's nothing more mistaken about mediation than this idea, right? The idea, you can bring the parties to the mediation, but they don't want to settle. First, if you think of the individual case, if the parties are, if the horses are thirsty and the water is good, <laughs> the horse might drink and be grateful to you. But if your horse, or you, we, we the horse, don't drink, we don't care, we as a society. Because a policymaker is not to be concerned with one case. The policymaker is to be concerned with the generality. So the policy approach is lead all your horses to water. Count the benefits when mediation is successful. Count the costs when mediation is not. Remember that break-even point? And if the number is positive, that's a good thing. Of course, you might suffer because you go to court once in your life. Before going to court, you have to go to mediation because of this. And mediation fails, it sucks. But no matter how we care about ourselves, what's more important is us as a society, as people. And what about budget implications too? A few years back, based on numbers and data from the Council of Europe, it turned out that the average litigant in the uh, member states would only pay 20% of the cost of the trial. That is, you take how much money is given to judges, uh, the bailiffs, to rent the rooms for the courthouse, and so on and so forth. 20% is paid by the litigants with the court fees. What about the rest? It's the non-litigants. <laughs> Through the general taxation, we contribute to paying for the justice system. Now, question. Shouldn't the 80% of the people <laughs> ask the 20%, dear, why don't you try this first? Right? So if you look at the numbers as well, the solution is pretty clear. Now, of course, um, no animal was uh, harmed in the shooting of this, and I do hope this was a Photoshop. This refers to the idea when, when we, especially if we force people to drink, we want um, to make sure that the mediation is of good quality. Sometimes proponents of mandatory mediation are seen as cynical people who just want to have more cases, as if um, mediation quality doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, but it's, again, uh, a fallacy in the rationale because people get better at mediating the more mediations they do. And therefore, incentivizing through policies the practice will only lead to better results. Uh, for that, and one of the reasons why I was so happy and grateful to accept this invitation, um, the, behavior, the behavior, the legislative reforms happening in more and more countries and you will be hearing about some today. The science, especially psychology and behavioral economics, the approach of international organizations to mediation have led us at the foundation to launch the Sustainable Conflict Global Initiative. And the idea is that advocating for international consensus on the principle that mediation should be tried, at least in certain cases, in what cases is a very important question, 
we don't have time today, I don't want to go into that today, in order to see changes. Think about the Paris Accord about the environment. What would we have if there was not a target? 30% reduction of the emissions by. The same is what the SCGI advocates for mediation. By whatever policy means necessary, providing incentives, making it free, making it mandatory, or better off, better yet, opt out, member states by 2030, when the Sustainable Development Goals agenda must be completed, will have to show that a minimum percentage of cases has gone through mediation first. And with that, I thank you very much. Look forward to being here, to working with the students tomorrow. Thank you once again to all of you.